Here we are on this chilly morning on the Madhouse. Kevin Van Buren and Kathleen making their way across the river where we'll set up shop do some filming and do some video and do some fishing today we're on the snowy Methow River on another crisp winter morning and we're here to talk about fly fishing in these types of conditions. It's cold, the water's low and clear, and fishing has to be, the techniques have to be changed a little bit in these conditions. Mm -hmm. I'm with Kevin Van Buren, he's with North Cascades Fly Fishing. And Kevin and I have known each other for years. We floated the river in the winter. We fished Rocky Ford together. Mm -hmm. And this guy spends a lot of days on the river year round. And he's here today to share what he knows about fly fishing in these types of conditions. Now, we were talking earlier that actually the, the Matt Howe River is at average flows for this time of year, which is how many CFS? Well, if you're looking at the Pateras, you're probably looking at about 330 to 350 right now. Yeah. Um, you know, up here where we are, a little bit farther up, we're looking at uh, the mid-200s. Right. And Kevin actually uh, gave me a call this morning because he knew I was on my way up. It was five degrees at his house. And he was thinking, maybe we want to rethink this because <laughs> our plan here is today to just not only share information about tackle and technique, but also do some fishing so we have some action in our second sequence. But boy, I have presented you with a challenge today. <laughs> you have. We have shelf ice, we have chunks of ice floating down the river, but one of the things, uh, I was up here recently too, is there's no reason to get out of bed and rush up here earlier in the morning. No, no reason to get up early. Great time to go have that coffee and, and muffin at the bakery, talk about it a little bit, and then come on out. Midday is the time to be here. Right, about 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock, and we've even seen the, the ice dissipate a little bit. Mm -hmm. At least it reduces the amount of slush that's flowing down the stream. We still have the shelf ice to deal with. But now you've been uh, North Cascades fly fishing for how long? Well, officially that company has been around for uh, about a dozen years, but yeah. I've been in the valley um, guiding and, and guiding on private lakes and things like that for over 15 and personally been in the valley fly fishing for a little over 20. That's right. And oftentimes um, I will advise clients that, that call me and want to know what's what's going on in the Met How, what's, what's current conditions, what patterns are working, those types of things. I direct them to you and they get a hold of you through Sun Mountain Lodge. I do. I book my guide service through Sun Mountain. I also happen to work in that shop and we're a recreation shop and a fly shop and, and we give tons of free advice. People that may not even use my guide service may or may not shop in our shop, but they just want to know uh, either conditions or river levels for safety, especially whether the floating, some advice of where to go, that type of thing. That's exactly why I direct people to you. You're always very welcome to answer any kind of questions. I really appreciate you sharing the river flow information, safety concerns, also current what's working now and Kevin's always willing to answer those questions. Now you mentioned some private lake fishing. Mm -hmm. That's also booked through the lodge and you guide on Moccasin Lake, is that right? That's correct, yep. Good, yeah. that is a fun, beautiful spot too. It is beautiful. The neighboring ranch to Sun Mountain, it's a 4,000 acre piece that looks over the valley. The lake itself is 35 acres. Huge fish, uh, triploids, uh, rainbows, browns, and it's all catch and release and, and private select fishery. So, you know, fantastic. Yeah. <clears throat> now, one of the things we were talking about earlier too is not only are steelhead abundant in the the Matt Howe this time of year, but you're going to have incidental catches of everything from bull trout uh, to some beautiful cutthroat, white fish. And, and in fact, there's even coho present in, in the river at uh, late times of the year in the late fall, early winter. 
That's right. You know, sometimes you might even hook into some other salmon, but of course we don't target those, and those are pretty rare. But this year, the coho uh, numbers were higher than they've been. It was the first time in 30 years that they actually opened up the fishery on the Metau. Yeah. So that was really fun for people. But like I said, we've got whitefish, resident, um, rainbow, um, and, and the bull trout, and great cutthroat fishery, of course. So you could go through a day and hit three, four, and a special day would be even five species. It would be incredible. just amazing. <clears throat> Well, if you haven't visited the Methow Valley, it's one of the most beautiful places on the face of this earth. The fishing on the Methow now is almost a year-round prospect. You have great rainbow trout, cutthroat fishing through the uh, spring and summer months, and then we roll right into steelhead fishing. And as you say, now, uh, even last year, you know, we had our first coho season on the, on the Methow River. So there's a tremendous variety of things to do. And lots, lots of river. I, I, I've said that if there's a river in heaven, it's probably the Mahal, because <laughs> it's it's a great stream for all kinds of anglers, but it is very popular with fly fishermen, and that's what we're going to talk about next: is what kind of tackle to approach the Mahal River in these low, clear, and cold conditions. No one is happy about having to repair a vehicle after an accident. However, I was very happy when I chose First Choice Collision Center when I needed this service. I can't say enough about how they treated me. Fast and friendly just doesn't say enough. They have amazing technology to make a damaged vehicle look like new. At First Choice Collision Center, you can expect modern service with old-fashioned values. That was my experience, and I'm sure it will be yours, too. Your town Ford is kicking off the season with the best deals of the year. It's the Built Ford Tough Truck Event. Great power and amazing fuel economy means no compromises. And that's what you get in a truck built Ford Tough. Like the Ford F-150 with a powerful and efficient EcoBoost engine. The power you want and the economy you need. Or Ford Super Duty with its amazing 6.7 liter power stroke turbo diesel. If you're looking for power, payload, towing, economy, your town Ford's got the truck for you. Head to your town Ford in East Wenatchee. Well, I had Mr. Van Buren, Kevin, bring a couple of rods. Uh, we're actually going to talk about two different rods and two different styles of casting and presenting uh, flies on the Matt Howe in these conditions. And what I, this rod I'm familiar with because uh, when we fish together, I know this is your, say, standard rod that, mm -hmm. that you use consistently out here. Uh, in a lot of conditions, but it works very well in this low water, uh, cold weather conditions too. And this is, uh, what length of rod have you got? And this one's a 10 foot, so it is, you know, it's got a lot of length still. It is a traditional rod, single handed rod. Um, you know, you can go anywhere from a 9 foot, 9 and a half, 10 foot. I, I wouldn't definitely not go any shorter than 9 feet. And, you know, some people, they, they feel that, hey, um, on the interior here in the northwest, they can get away with a six weight for steelhead fishing. I personally like to go seven weight and above. And the reason is, if I'm fighting big fish, um, you know, if, we, if we're lucky enough to get into a big one, I can horse him in a little bit, and I don't have to overpressure him, especially if he's native and I want to get him released. But also, if I'm steelheading, I'm probably throwing big stuff. And I want that extra oomph and not a, a six weight wouldn't cut it, especially if it got windy. So I like a seven weight, maybe eight. Personally, the 10 foots are really nice because also, again, for mending and for throwing heavy stuff, it works. This one's a sage rod. It's a seven foot, uh, sorry, seven weight, 10 foot TCX. Mm -hmm. And I've got a sage reel. This is an older um, school sage reel. It's the old 3400D. It is still large arbor. And, um, and then I've got a line on it, just a standard, uh, the real gold line. Mm -hmm. And this one's an eight weight, uh, weight forward, eight weight floating line, even though it's a seven weight rod, but I like to go up one weight when I know I'm throwing big stuff. And of course, if I'm steel heading or and I'm nymphing, I'm always throwing big stuff. Well, and you're gonna work a lot less hard when you've got a longer rod. It just takes a lot of the effort out of it. And like you say, in some t sometimes, you're not even traditionally fly casting. You're almost pitching or, or rolling your line out there. And the longer rod really makes that easy. For sure, because I'm uh, you'll see me later, I, I flip it and then I roll it. 
and those are two different things. Um, there are times where I do a standard back cast, but sometimes you're in a position that you might be against a tree, and so you have to be able to flip and roll anyways. Exactly. In fact, um, one of the other rods that I'm going to have Kevin show you is a switch rod, and he's going to describe how he sets that up, but then also we're going to do a little segment and he's going to demonstrate that out on the water too before we actually get into fishing so people get an idea of the different styles of casting that, that is required this time of year on the mat house. So you've got a switch rod on here today too. Yeah, and uh, these have become popular just like the 9 foot 6 and 10 foot traditional rods became popular you know, a dozen years ago in the Northwest yeah. um, as the spay fishing picked up but those are a little bit heavy require two-handed casting this is an in-between which is why they call it a switch yes it's light enough that I can cast it with one arm if you did that for eight hours you'd feel it in your shoulder so once in a while I'll put my second hand in here and that really gives me the power to flip it and roll it which I'll show later but also they tend to be a bit longer this one is um, 11 foot 3 inches it is also a seven weight but it's quite powerful for a seven weight so it's a seven weight, 11 foot, and then I'm fishing a sage reel again. This one's the newer style, a little lighter weight. It's the, uh, this one's a 4580, the CFS. Um, and then I, I run a reel line again on here as well, and it's the power spay lines, which has the ability to add some tips and things like that. But when I'm just right. straight indicator fishing, it's like a dry line, um, and it's a power spay 5.6, and you would think, well, that's the opposite. Now I'm underweighting, but that's what you do with a switch rod um, because these lines are so heavy in the belly which you need for rolling you don't want to match it up exactly and, oh, and Rio okay. can help you do that or any of your dealers can help you match that um, very interesting yeah okay yeah well that's that's great now also uh, with the, with the two-handed rod one of the questions I asked uh, a friend of mine recently was spay casting is really not done for accuracy it's for distance with the two-handed switch rod, do you get better accuracy than you would if you were, say, spay casting? Yeah, most likely you would. And also, I feel the spay is used a lot when you're going to then swing. Yeah. And in this temperature and stuff, we'll talk about, I think nymphing is the better method. And uh, there's times where I drift my indicator, and I'm like, you know, that's good, but I want to be 10 more inches across or this way. I could probably slow it down a little bit better. So there's times where I'm really nitpicking that current, and I can do that with this. Right. And those are two styles that are very popular for steelhead fishing that you just mentioned. Swinging the fly and then indicator fishing. And tell me if I'm wrong, it seems to me when you get into these real low, clear conditions, and particularly low temperatures where these fish are not active, they're not using a lot of energy, that probably that's when your nymphing and indicator fishing really comes into play. And I tell you what, answer that question, and show me how you set that up and some of your favorite nips right here in our next session. Hooked on toys! As winter settles into our area, many savvy anglers are shifting their attention to the big reservoirs. Lake Roosevelt, Rufus Woods, and Banks Lake all offer great trout fishing in the winter, and Hooked on Toys has what you need to get them. Ask Rick what he uses to catch the big triploids at Rufus Woods, and you'll find what you need for fishing from shore or from a boat on the shelves at Hooked on Toys. See them at 1444 North Wenatchee Avenue, or visit them online at hookedontoys.com. Hi, I'm Dave Graybill, the Fish and Magician, and I'm sitting in front of the Lake Pateras Inn. Lake Pateras Inn is one of the most convenient places you can stay if you like to fish for salmon or steelhead on the Upper Columbia River. You can moor your boat at the dock, or there are two ramps within yards. They have outdoor power so you can charge your electric motor. Rooms are clean and comfortable and very affordable. Everything you need is right here at the Lake Pateras Inn. Well, Kevin, now just before we pause, we mentioned swinging and nymphing. And I, I said now, correct me if I'm wrong, but when the water is, it's more of water temperature right now. When these fish get lethargic, they're trying to use as little energy as possible. Am I right by saying that that's when you switch from swinging to nymphing? 
Yeah, you know, with water temps in the at the beginning of the season in October, you're going to see them in the low 50s, which is great. You can even dry fly for them. Um, but swinging is definitely appropriate. 40s is fine too. But we're looking at water temp, you know, when we get these conditions anywhere from, you know, 35 to 37, 38 degrees. When it gets that cold, these fish at first, especially, they'll get that ice cream headache. And, and they're not in the grabby mood. They're not going to chase. They're not going to see something six feet away and go chase it, which is what you want when you're swinging. Um, you might not even have to swing on the bottom. You could be up a little bit higher. They're going to come from a, from afar. And so that's why this river, um, as we enter November and later, really nymphing is, is really good. Um, also, if it's this cold, the water gets so low that instead of these big wide runs, you're looking at narrow slots. And to get a sink tip to swing down and back up and not get caught is pretty tough. Nymphing down in that trench is better. When I, I like to see double this CFS earlier in the year because then I can go to runs where the steelhead will sit, where they're not sitting now. Those runs would be more swingable. You know, uh, structure, uh, depths like this or deeper, 30 feet wide, you know, something more like the Wenatchee. Well, and you mentioned, you know, trying to have line control. When, you know, you, you've got to get deep, but then your line's going to be right down in the rocks, and you're going to get hung up, and you're not really fishing a lot of the time. <laughs> where with the mint team, just like barber fishing, as we do, or float fishing, now you've got control and you're familiar with the depths. You can adjust your uh, indicator mm -hmm. so that you're putting that right six inches to a foot off bottom right in the zone consistently. Yeah, sometimes I'll even keep going until I see that I'm nicking a couple of times, back it up four, five, six inches. Then I know at least I'm down where the fish are if I think they're on the bottom. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And uh, one of the other things that, that we'll just touch on briefly is to your mind too now are you getting a longer drift with the nymphing and i'm talking about the fact you're dealing with ice so the longer you can keep your, your line in the water uh the better off you are because the more casting you do the more icing you're going to get yeah and we'll talk about this um you know i feel once you're fishing keep fishing so if you've spent the time to cast it mend it all that and you finally get your fly six and a half eight feet deep keep it there because if it's only there for three feet and all of a sudden you're done drifting, why not keep feeding line? And that's where that mend originally comes into play because you're setting yourself up once you're fishing for an additional 20, 30 feet of fishing. You times that by 100 casts during the day. You've really... Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Well, I tell you what, now that we've covered those aspects, what I want to do, I'm going to take a, just a quick break while... Kevin, you dig into your fly box, and we're going to look at some of his favorite patterns and also some of the indicators that he uses here on the Methow River in the winter. Well, I've had Kevin reach into his bag of tricks here, and uh, one of the first things I wanted you to show us, Kevin, was the style of indicator that you use. He's got some nice flies arranged, but first of all, let's talk indicators. Well, I've got a couple of here. I like the frog hairs myself, and uh, and it's a oval shape of foam. I've got two sizes in my hand here. I've got the extra large and the, the large. And for the type of fishing I do and the weight that I need this time of year to get down, I'm at no smaller than the large and sometimes even the extra large. And they give you these little rubber pieces to help uh, secure it, but I just get rid of those and I use a toothpick. I send the line right down the middle and I'll later talk about why I use straight tippet because I don't want too many knots to deal with. Put that right down the middle, use my toothpick and at a moment's notice I can yank the toothpick. It's not usually that long, of course. I stuck it in there, I cut it. I can yank that little piece of toothpick out, move it six inches, six feet, two feet, whatever I need, cure it again. And, um, and I like the two color, and we'll talk about that later when we're fishing. Gives you good visibility in these conditions. Yeah. Okay, now let's talk about some of your favorite patterns here. Well, you know, I feel that going natural in this river is really key. Um, you know, with spin fishermen and everything else, they get to see big, colorful jigs, and those definitely work. But sometimes those fish get used to that, and they do remember growing up and eating the natural stuff. So I, I use a lot of stone patterns. Here's a couple different sizes. I tend to use bigger ones. They, they probably are heavier. Helps me get down. And then behind that, 18 inches, 2 feet, I'll usually send something else, usually a little smaller. Um, 
this one here um, looks like a very large coronamid, and this one obviously is kind of eggy looking, but they've got some bright color to it. They've got some curvature to it, so it can look kind of nymph-like, especially this one. Um, and then, smaller yet, I'll use you know, the basic rubber leg copper john. Most people disregard the coronamids, but that's truly what's out there a lot. And you can also pick up other fish. And then, of course, when the salmon are spawning, you get the basic egg pattern um, above a hook. You want to make sure you understand how to fish that. You don't want it too close or too far. You want to be safe and make sure you're only hooking the fish in the, in the jaw there. So, and then there's a combination of all these you play around with because of weights and colors and sizes. Well, I had a glimpse at your box and there are hundreds in there. So this is just a few examples of what you have in your arsenal, but basic patterns that are go-to for this time of year. Also, I was wondering, I noticed most of these are a beadhead for weight. Are any of them lead wire wrapped for weight? Yeah, this one right here has that. And, um, and when I make flies, you know, I can adjust how many wraps I put on there. I might even make two or three of the same size, but for different weights, heavy currents, really heavy, especially down in the canyon, a little bit slower pools, ones that sink a little slower. And I, I use a, um, a non-lead wrap because of uh, the, I don't want to put lead in the river if I was to lose one or, or snag one up or something. Well, that's great. I'll tell you what, let's tie up a few of these and get them wet. Let's get out on the river, show people some casting, and maybe even catch a fish. Okay, Kevin is approaching the hole, this particular hole, and he's opted to uh, throw the switch rod, a uh, little heavier rod, Got that big indicator on, and uh, hopefully what you'll be able to see is how he mends that indicator to make sure that's upstream of what he's fishing with as it drifts through the hole. And with luck, there might be a fish or two in here. And I am confident that if they're in there and in a mood to uh, bite the uh, pink bead that he has at the bottom or the stone fly above it, Kevin knows how to present it. Makes a nice sharp snap of the rod tip, and that just flips that line upstream so he's getting a proper presentation. Very interesting. That was the most interesting hook set I think I've ever seen, Kevin. I haven't seen you run up the river pulling the line as you went. His fish is under the shelf ice. He's got to break his way out to it. It's not a steelhead. Doesn't think it's a steelhead. <laughs> but that was my third drift through there. That was good. 
That's a fairly sizable fish. This is where you kind of have to be very careful because this ice is sharp enough that if you cut your line, but even you, and you want to just break an opening to get to your fish so you can release them safely. There. That might make it a little easier on the next drift through. <laughs> You've cleared a path to the water. Nice, long, fat, uh, met how white fish. Oh, it's big. He took the egg. That's quite a big white fish, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's right up there with that 18, 19 inch. Really good warm up fish for you. The goal of battery systems is to provide the best products combined with the most efficient service at competitive prices. I've found their people live up to this, so don't buy anything without talking to them. You should make their batteries and accessories your choice to power your vehicles and boats. This is Dave Graybill and I choose battery systems to keep me running on shore and on the water. To find a battery systems product expert in a location near you, log on to batterysystems.net. Gaboon Productions LLC is a full service video production company right here in the Wenatchee Valley. Gaboon is a term coined by my grandfather, commercial fishing in Alaska. It's when a bunch of fish hit your net all at the same time. We capture life as you see it. From filming those special moments to catching something big, Gaboon Productions LLC can record it, edit it, and save it for you forever. We do weddings, theater productions, concerts, reunions, commercials, and more. Go to GaboonProductions.com on the web, check us out on Facebook, and on YouTube. Gaboon Productions LLC, the little video company capturing your big moments. Not sure how well you can see it, but we actually walked upstream here and broke off the shelf ice it really makes casting difficult because your line sticks to it your leader could get cut on the edge of it and we would have to break a path to the shore if we hooked a fish thinking that might make a change and of course now we we hooked one so we'll see we don't want that 3x against the ice <laughs> No. I'm going to uh, break ice right in here. He's already starting to go so underneath his shell. Thankfully, this isn't that hard. I was just telling Kathleen I was sure that Kevin was going to get a fish out of this stretch, and there he did. Now, the other thing is. I might need some help breaking ice if this fight is a long time because as the line goes in and out, it keeps bringing water. And I'm in the shade right now, and that ice is only going to get thicker on the guides. So I might have to run down there, grab your rod tip, and crack ice. Hey, can I throw some gear stuff out there, Dave? Yep. This is the other reason I like to fish with a seven weight or above. Usually your guides are a little larger, and that's just that much longer time before your ice would close up. Those six weight rods that sometimes people like to fish, that ice is gonna build up pretty quick in those small guides. Good point. You saw a pretty big tail, eh? Yeah, he's rolling. I can see he's a pretty big fish. And uh, looks like a pretty nice male steelhead, possibly. Yeah, he's rolling around in there. Playing pretty nice. Pretty nice run, not too much to breathe. I'd just as soon him stay here since I've got my area broken of ice already. You know, when I'm dealing with ice and I did go lighter tip it since it was a little tougher day of fishing, a little low water, I, I like to set my drag a little light. I'd rather let them wear out just a little rather than chance of snapping them off and leaving gear in them. With this ice, sometimes it'll grab so fast that if you have just a little tension on that reel, 
it's so easy to snap them when they want to run and your line hesitates for just a second. He's not going for the blasting runs, but he surely does not want to come up into these shallows. I might pull him down onto this point here. Of course, he doesn't have that same idea. No, he doesn't, Kevin. He doesn't. He wants to stay in that deeper water. Just keep, keep my eye up on those guys. They seem to be doing pretty good. Maybe it's my excitement, my hot breath is right. That. <laughs> Conducting uh, the heat through the length of the rod. <laughs> I've warmed up all of a sudden stepping into this cold water, but I, I have a feeling it's not the air. <laughs> oh boy, he just won't budge right there. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Kathleen has to break her way ice, break ice to get out there to Kevin. Oh, that is a, oh, okay, now I see it. Oh my goodness. Can you turn around, Kip? I'm inching my way. That is a bigger fish than I first thought when I first yeah, saw I, it. I saw the size of that tail and it was hard to get a look on that fish. Oh my goodness. Well, you had to go slow with that light tippet. I mean, a good head shake out of that guy and you would have been done. Oops, get that later. Yeah, he's there. That is a big fish. Okay, I'm gonna keep that head in the water. Right. Look at the girth. That is a big fish. I want to make sure everything's wrapped off, of, wrapped off of her. But okay, I'm gonna put her in the water. There we go. Okay. Here we go. A wild fish. So we've got to keep her in the water. Yeah. My nice goodness, fish. that is. A beauty. It really is. We'll get her back in. That's the one we want on the spawning beds. And off she goes. <laughs> well, Kevin, I told Kathleen if anybody could do it, you could. <laughs> you did, man. That was a fabulous fish. Gosh, yeah, she was beautiful. Deep. Really. Long. Oh, yeah. Nice girth. You know, and I was thinking, you said that was the peak of the heat of the day was forecast to be 230 and that's mm -hmm. right about right when we hit, hit that fish yep yeah and one of the things that occurred to me in the last couple of trips I made up here there's a very short window for fishing we usually have to wait till almost noon for the slush to clear off and then it starts to get dark so you've got a brief window you, for fishing that you do when you're tr truly talking winter steelhead which I think five degrees in the morning would would say that that's winter yeah. um you know and if you have a breeze or even a cloud cover which some people get excited about and they want but really these fish are used to bright sunny days and so that's not a factor here on the medhow and you know with your own pleasure in terms of getting to be able to tie something on or or whatnot um and then the fish to be active sometimes it is squarely in the middle of the day and you got to look at the weather and it could be at noon but it could be at one and it's going to be 90 minutes wherever that nice period is yeah. it's 90 minutes and, and it goes oh the other man, way that's right and here we are right now with deep breath going in the air again yep yep but man what a fabulous day to be up here uh Lots of pressure on you today, and you sure came through. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's so good to get back together with you. What a great demonstration on how to fish. Low water, clear water, in cold conditions. Yeah. Your steelhead on the mat, Al. That's always great to have you back up here, Dave. Thanks.